going to give people more time. So I'm, I'm going to tell kind of my story, just my experience with the Amiga crew and all that kind of, how I got into it, stuff on it there, how it served me well later. So also at this time, I'm going to tell you about the singular most incredible feat of software engineering I've witnessed in my ridiculously long career. And I think it's worth listening to, so I think you can talk to in here. I met Jim McGrath, I'm a software guy. I'm going to today kind of talk about how I, how I got in on this Amiga thing in Los Gatos. Uh, and then a little bit about what happened uh, from my perspective. And then sort of how it sort of served me going forward and what amounts to my career that I have led to retirement. So I'm going to start my story. Uh, when I was held hostage, I was actually a slave in, in New Jersey. And it's going to involve a guy named George Breen. and probably only two people in this room or in the building to know who George Breen is. So uh, I kind of half dropped out of math professor school in Princeton. I was working over the summer at a place called Exxon Office Systems, making word processor stuff. And, and I was the UI design guy, and George Breen was a developer. And anybody who's been in this industry knows the UI guy and the developer are always at war, and this guy and I did not get along. In fact, I have a memorable moment he said, he said, Jim, I want you to sit there and listen and try to learn. And I don't know if you guys, anybody knows me. <laughs> no, that doesn't work so well for me. So, uh, so I finished dropping the rest of the way out of math school and I took a job at the same company, the same team as a developer. And the first act of the work management I ever experienced, the boss made me share a room with this guy, Jordan. So obviously we turned out to be best friends and colleagues. We hooked up with a third guy and we were building a graphics workstation with only one of them. And we did something, now you know, you know these days they talk about pair programming. Our version of that was 16 hour shifts with eight hour overlap. So you, you work with one guy for eight hours, and you get something going, and the next guy would come and say, oh my god, what have you done? And then they build on that, and you come back eight hours later. And so we did that for a while, and it really rocked, it was really righteous work, so needless to say, that ship sunk. So George Green heads off to Commodore, and he lives in Pennsylvania, and he can stand it. And I had to get out of Dodge, so I moved to Boulder, Colorado. I had a friend there who was running like an underground railroad to try to get people out of New Jersey so they could find a life. It was sort of like a steady stream of former Bell Labs guys, and they go to they go to ATT, and they go out of there. Uh, and so I joined this cat company that will remain nameless because they just suck. And uh, it was bad, and it was bad for a lot of ways, and I'll, I'll talk about more. But uh, while I was there, that's when the Amiga Byte magazine article came out. And I don't think we used this imagery at the time. It was basically, you know, boom, you know. And, and it was, it was, you know what it was. It was too amazing, too good to be true. I was a graphics guy by that point. I had a lot of geometry. I was looking forward to being able to do on computers. And it blew my mind. So I immediately hooked up with a buddy there. We started saying, we got to do a CAD company start for this amazing Amiga. And the luckiest thing was that they, that got stupid really, really fast. So we didn't, we, we got, but I was, I was pretty discouraged. So here's this amazing thing. Here's this sort of pipe dream about doing a CAD startup. Here's this crappy company. And uh, for example, they didn't have a Kiki Y port for me to plug into. I even bought my own terminal. I didn't know where to plug it in. So I had to look over the shoulder of this guy named Dennis. And he's using VI, and he's like clicking one character at a time. And he's sitting going L, 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 L. Yeah. Ooh, H, 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 yeah. And it's just a little bit in my mind. The worst thing about the gig was that they only had Pepsi machines, and I'm a Coca Cola man. So it was bad. So one day, in a, in a moment of great distress, and I actually, I remember very well, I was sitting like this on my desk in great distress, and my head was right next to the phone. Remember phones? <laughs> remember there used to be a debate of whether you could use them for personal use? You know, that was good. Anyway, this phone rings, and I have a heart attack, and it's the best call of my career. It's Bob Periscope, VP of Amiga. I wonder if you want to come in and have a talk. So it appears to have happened, well, by all accounts, uh, Commodore shut down the Unix box and George Breen got out to Los Gatos to find a new gig or else he had to move on. And he shows up, he's wearing wingtip shoes, blue suit, you know, hold a scotch and smoking a pot, you know? And he tells me, oh, these guys are all wearing Birkenstocks and drinking herbal tea. So according to him at least, the story was, uh, you know, this isn't going to work out, but good news, I know your boy. So, he turned those guys into a Paris one me, I get the call, so I, I cruise out to a, I cruise out to those guys who get wearing no suit. Uh, so, so, I, so I get out there and I show up at 9 o'clock in the morning, and Nancy Reigns, who I wish for care, I loved her so much, 
stuff. That, so she showed, I show up and, she, and it's 9 o'clock in the morning. And they said, 9 o'clock, where are you doing? Nobody's here until 10. RJ's still sleeping in his office. I don't, I don't think he's a ball. <laughs> so, to try to so skip a little bit of interview stuff that I don't really remember, the, the team decided to place a bet on me. And the summary paragraph of my resume was enough to win over the GM. Like I did my numbers. And, uh, and it was looking pretty good. But I, I don't know what I am, but I was basically just too good to be true. So I just didn't trust it. I mean, I've been dreaming about the media. You know, all that's here after too good to be true. So I go, I'm not a religious guy. See that on my Facebook. But I, I believe in signs from God. I said, I need a sign from God. So I got two of them. So the first one was sitting at the cafeteria, um, filled in the application. And I look up, and there are two side by side towering Coke machines. <laughs> and, and at that point, I started to hear organ music. You know? So I'm doing pretty good. You know, so we're going to go to lunch. We're going to have lunch. Let's grab Gail. You know, so we duck into Gail's office. I peek in there. And on this guy's desk, he's got two huge clipped speakers. Huge clipped speakers. Like, oh, OK, Shangri-La. This is it. You know, God's speaking to me. we gotta, we got to get this done. Later, by the way, you couldn't even see those speakers because this moat of our battle of like used diaphragm. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll let you hear it. Anyway, it's pretty disgusting in there over the long term. So, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, so Barb, my wife and I, we rolled this two-stroke saw on a moving van when we were Bell Coast Cabin. So for a little context, I showed up after the acquisition, after the, the signatures were in the box. Um, I was there after some of the best stories. Never met Joe Pillow. Uh, the hardware was pretty much done, and I know, especially from my recent gigs, when the hardware's not done, it's a different world. So the hardware would run. And um, I never saw a foam bat battle. So, uh, you know, sort of second tier. But when I did arrive, it was when the third grade development uh, business was really kicking in. And it's, it's basically a new chapter. So it's not a lot of stuff to hear about. It's certainly not, you know, figure out, you know, how to do sprites timing. But it was a different thing. Very interesting work and a lot of interesting people to meet. The PA was just a little puff. And it was really interesting at that. So on my first day of work, and so by the way, RJ, I took it away, taking over RJ's code. He's there for like a week. My first day of work, I show up, and I'm marveling at my personal son workstation. We're calling, I didn't even have a port for a TDI because so they're trapped in place. And I'm filling out my insurance paperwork. It's kind of good because I haven't had health insurance for four weeks, or for four months. And I get acute appendicitis. So that day I'm in the hospital, that day I'm cut open, I'm in the hospital for, I don't know, sort of like almost a week. So I never saw him again, really. <laughs> and and uh, they bring me the source code to the hospital, you know. <laughs> you know, hard copy. So I'm leafing through it. You know, it's, you know, it's printed, nice printer, you know. I'm leafing through it, and it's looking pretty good, really. You know, it's alert.c. Buttons.c. I remember, you know, what do you get? Gadget.c. It might have been a command.c or a dialogue.c. Then they get the intuition.c. <laughs> And I'm trying to figure out how to characterize, so I decided I'm just going to say, it was a masterpiece. <laughs> it was a complex piece of software. Uh, so I got healthy, and I got back to work, and I don't know who, I think probably Neil Caden said, oh, here's a bug report you might want to look at. And uh, something about window from window back and loop, and you touch it, the whole machine freezes. So it, basically, the, much of the system was heavily multi-threaded, but not particularly re-entered. So most of my yoga from then on was, was dealing with that. And so it was interesting work. I didn't know about any of that stuff. Let me tell you, that gave me interview questions for programmers for like the next three decades. You know? So I got that stuff down now. You know? so, uh, so that was pretty much what I was doing. So I want to talk about a little bit of there, sort of in general terms, about being on the team in Los Gatos. Um, at this point in time, we think of it as the glory aspects of it. And, you know, frankly, it jumps by me so. But when I was there, long before I was there, and after I left, including the Pennsylvania team, it was really about the work. I mean, it was work in place. Um, I felt like I joined the NBA. And you the story of these college girls who joined the NBA, and they see that everybody's playing above the rim. If all the, you know, they always get below the rim. It's, it's kind of like the A team. And I had been, I think my first game, I was the smartest guy in the building, and kind of, did real well, I went to the stupid cat company, I want to shoot myself, and then, oh, it's a monster, these guys are all really, really good. They had a development pattern that I, I later called Hunter Killer, 
which was somebody would show up and say, hey, we have a problem, and I thought about it, and I think that's what we should do. They'd say, okay, let's do that, and boom, they go off and do it. You know, we were talking, we were getting into the what's different between then and now. I could go long on that one, but, and they were all working hard, you know, they were working hard, you know. And uh, I had already learned that my wife would like do stuff like learn dead languages rather than be bored waiting at home, so I was kind of off the hook for that. But but it wasn't just these guys you're seeing on the stage, you know. But, but you know, Bart Whitebook and Kodiak Burns, one of them, sing a lot. Neil Cade was my office mate. Uh, Stan Shepard's team. And people working hard, you know, and that's that was that was setting a bar. And most of all, though, and this is really actually quite important to me, they were on a mission from God. They might not have believed in God, some did, some did. They all believed in the Blue Brothers, but they were on a mission from God. They even had a t-shirt. Hey, I'm on a mission from God. Or no, it's actually, hey, we're busy. I'm on a mission from God. And this is actually kind of important. Anyway, I do off the back of it, but I want to say there were some kind of glorious moments. Right after I got there, I'd go and speak at the Eastbourne England Developer Conference. Who was there? Wow, there were a lot of people there. It was on the south coast of England in the dead of winter. Terrible. But we show up there and we got the new jackets, the silver satin jackets that just come out. And over there, there were a lot of Commodore freaks, which both Europeans know, and they were just dying for information because there wasn't any. And so we were in the hotel lobby checking in after an all night flight, and where I think we just stayed up and drank. And they swarmed us and they gathered around us and they started pawing our jackets. <laughs> Jim Goodnow. By the way, Jim Goodnow, he was the guy who wrote the C Bank C compiler and he wrote the VI. So I was coming up with all, I'm sitting there coating my ass off, I'm thinking of all these enhancements to VI, and I'd say, hey, you know, it'd be great if you get into this, you know. And then he'd like tap for a while and he'd hand me a floppy enhancement burned in. So people used to talk about VI is not as macro customizable as Emacs. You know, look at the guy who wrote it sitting next to you, it's pretty customizable. So, <laughs> so uh, there were some pretty rock moments, even yeah, at the phase that I, I got in on. Yeah, after the big Lincoln Center launch. So uh, back to the work. Uh, my, my stuff, making the stuff Thread Save was sort of my primary yoga, but I got to develop a lot of cool stuff. And it was cool that you could have an idea and, and you could pretty much get people to agree to it. You could code it up and get it in. You didn't have to go through a standards body. I had a good friend, actually a big amigo of personality, Chuck McMahon, so I was working in front of the time. He was working on stuff that had to just get crap by standards body before we'd ever see the light of day. So we really had an open door to do that. That's a really rare, when you're building a system that's going to have the developers be able to have an idea and execute on it and get to customers without going through, you know, basically standardization issues. Uh, I, you know, we have more fun. I see the Android guys can do that now a little bit, then they have to undo it the next time. You know? <laughs> um, but um, the overbearing constraint, the technical constraint that we lived under all the time was code space in the ROMs. ROM, Wikipedia, read only memories, these little chips that you can't change that take three to four weeks to make. And that's where the OS had to fit. And forever we were squeezing that, and it got worse and worse and worse as it went on. So it got really bad. So, well, you know, the, the, the people got left, people kind of got laid off. And after a while, there's just like three or four of us hanging around and we're dancing from the front desk to the director of QA, Rich on. And so we had to put this release together, and it was not pleasant. And we did the final build, and we were due at the end of July, we'd be done. It's like the last day of July, we were built, and we did the final build, and we're 13 bytes over. And at that point, again, QA had been laid off. I mean, when that happened at the CAD company, hey, we laid off QA, it saved a lot of money, we got the release off quicker, you know? And it was laughing and laughing and laughing, and they did it to us, you know? So you can't touch stuff, you know, you just can't touch stuff. And so we're scared. By then, every little thing had been squeezed out of that. You know, like, like um, we, we would take if else statements and just remove them. We'd say A equals something, and if that was wrong, then A equals something else, because that saved like a fight. All the all the Easter eggs were gone. The we, we made Amiga, they effed it up was gone. By the way, uh, raise your hand if you uh, had your fingerprints on that one. And so yeah, just because the eight guys went like this, you know, they're hands on the floor. You want to find out that the core players were walking around and look at the guys with footprints on their hands right now. So, uh, um, 
there was another one, like the, the, if you recall, I mean, you built out the message dynamic and loaded modules, and they had an identifier string called ROMCAC, and that'd be the name of the library. So, like, the one I was involved with, raw input, and that was like RI. You know, all these things have been squeezed to death, and it's getting late, and our deadline's there. Uh, oh, yeah, I once had stayed up all night tactically declaring register variables, if anybody remembers that. Yeah. Because you know it's a big fight, and it made it much, much, much bigger because the compiler was smarter than said you know, it was. an entire register for you know. So then I spent the next night taking it all out. <laughs> so that was before this July 31st thing. We were sitting there trying to get this thing crunched, and we're stuck. And finally, Neil Caden, who is a true genius in his own twisted way, said, I've got it! We go drinking! <laughs> And, uh, and then we came back, and we did a new build, and in those little ROM tags, all the little July and the JUL 3.1s turned into AUG1s. And it saved one byte per library, and about 20 libraries, so we're both seven by seven, and we're done. <laughs> that, my friends, is the singular most incredible feat of software engineering I have ever seen in my life. And I've seen some weird shit. So, so we ship it off to Pennsylvania, and I think we've got out of it. I want to put it in you guys got like nine days to burn this thing, you know, because we're like, or else we can't make it no more. You know, so. and, and that is a true story. So uh, when it came time for me to move on, one of the things I learned was that achievement is its own reward. That's what we say to yourself if you don't make any money on a gig. Achievement is its own reward. But the problem is if you don't actually get a jackpot on the deal, you kind of have to keep achieving stuff, you know? Or, or the people forget you. I mean, you know, with the rare exceptions, like the people die off. I, I, I joined an internet company as management, and, and so he said, oh, who's that guy? You know, and they said, oh, you, where are the mean guys? They go, oh. Yeah. And way in the corner is one of the consultants. He goes, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, and then they, then, they, then they said, he also did the same. And they're like, oh, that was great. You know, so you gotta have a, you gotta refresh that shit over and over again. Or make it up money so it doesn't really matter. I like to point out, I see a lot of uh, high, high achievement guys here still have gigs. You know, you can join me on my new website, if I'm so smart, why aren't I rich? <laughs> All right, so let me tell you about another particular moment when I didn't get rich, ties my story forward. Uh, a guy named Jeff Brown who did the color fonts thing, uh, he was an uh, entrepreneur, software entrepreneur. The Amiga community invited me to see his band, his guys up in New Sacramento or something. And there's a guy named Will Wright working on this thing called, it's called Sim City. And I'm, I'm, you know, by that point, I'm like Mr. I'm like RJ, I'm like Mr. Yeah. You know, you get, you know, so I look, at, I look at the stuff and I go in the loud clear voice, I don't get it! What's the point? You know? <laughs> so it uh, turns out later when they were opening their huge new offices around this thing, there were a lot of other guys who worked there and said the exact same thing. So, so uh, I, I took that lesson pretty much. But anyway, that got me hooked up. So I got my connection to Jeff and Will and Max escape to my media experience. And that led to some good stuff. But I opened a technology group for Jeff. And when I went there, I brought some lessons I learned out of Megan. One of them is something I call mission-oriented management. You know, where it's about the mission, not about your other process and stuff like that. I just read some little about that, but I just sort of tried to establish a mission. And then when we segued over to Sims, nobody wanted a game about a dollar. They killed it three times. We just changed the name. But the team had a mission. It's got to be a holy mission. And in that case, we actually had a deity. Will, I think Jay was here. Will Wright's working for it. So we, we had that. I also tried to curb that hunter-killer behavior and it stuck on a couple people who turned out to be some app software developers. And I'm also trying to remind people, again, when I learned to be good, where they keep the rim. And that's the most important thing. There are a lot of people who think they're good. In fact, this guy turned out to be good in his self-review and he said, you know, where are you in the corner? He listed himself a 10 out of 10. You haven't met a 10. <laughs> so, so I hired an insane person named Don Hopkins. He was like, a, like, a, like an 11, you know. And, Help, help Eric figure out what the deal is. So anyway, we did set up a, a, a crusade around that. And it's just funny, just last week, I've got a new secret project at Amazon Live 126, where you do Kindle and Fire TV, it's a new generated product. And they're kind of thrashed from all reading BRDs and stuff, and we had the exact same conversation. We need to get people to code, we need to have a vision. So literally, applying at work as a director, the fundamental lesson that I learned in me. So there you go. I'll let you know if it ships. My last great thing was last year, it shipped. I'm still bitter. Um, 
So, uh, anyway, I've had a few other achievements and had various flavors of reward, and I got enough money to charge myself out a huge mortgage, so like I'm like hanging up to my job right now, so I, you know, I'm very successful in that regard. Uh, but in these days, I think a lot of us find ourselves in situations that are in many ways basically the opposite of Amiga. So I prepared this before somebody asked me that question about what's the old and the new, and I just brought a few. Mission from God has become corporate mission statement. Uh, what we used to ask is, does he get it? This is sort of a meeting. Does he get it? Does he, does he, does he, is he one of us? And that's now replaced with, is he a scrum master? I, we could talk a lot about that. I, I have what I call scrum bait. Uh, yeah, my interview is, tell me, you love scrum? Tell me two things good about it, two things bad about it. They go, two things bad about it. <laughs> okay, when's your project going to ship and how do you know? And, 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 so, uh, so, you know, things like Boeing demos and my favorite contribution, drop shadow stuff, have been replaced by business requirements. I got to take the point of the Harvard guys about marketing is your friend, you know, but you got to build stuff people want to buy. But uh, nevertheless, it's not as fun. And then waiting for your compile to finish, asleep as need be, is now replaced by waiting from, for some reviewer to plus two your code. So I want everybody to go off and think of how this Amiga thing were to come together if you would have had to get plus two on your code. Uh, and then the hot band development model, which was not just the Amiga, that was a trade of the times. Get the super group together, that has turned into uh, leveraging your offshore development team. And you can do great things if you figure that out. You can get a lot more done than eating your crazy people on caffeine or whatever you have to do, but, but it's not the same. And it's not the same, but I do think throughout it all, and I've seen it, and I think you can still see it in these guys, everybody's still trying to hang on to that high bar for what it means to achieve something. So that's a constant. That's something I'm learning to be, and that's something you should all learn. And if you forgot it after you created some outstanding app that made you go broke and have awkward Thanksgiving meals around your family slash investors, don't, don't forget that. So in, in closing again, I want to return it. Achievement is its own reward. But one of the key reasons achievement is its own reward is this. Strong teams are built through shared achievement. And hot teams are rare and precious, and life is short. And the bonds you form in these hot teams, being on a shared mission, can last for, evidently, 30 years. Oh and count. So basically, there, there really is just no substitute for a mission from God. I want to thank uh, Bob Pariseau and the team for, for uh, inviting me to join on the mission. Uh, thanks to all the developers and our limitations. It's nice that RJ noted that too. We put some people through pain. And uh, thanks to the community and the incredible organizers. The incredible organizers. Uh, for keeping a dream alive for 30 years. Uh, have a great time this weekend. Thanks very much. Don't forget to check out the museum. There's some mega stuff there. Little sin stuff there. I don't think we got a Kindle. I don't think we have a Kindle fire there, but thanks a lot.
work. Drop shadow is my favorite piece of work. By the way, if anybody has a source to drop shadow to, I'll pay you money for it. I lost it. And then, uh, anyway. All right, thanks a lot again. Have a good time.